This is a Mike Magazine special investigation. Will we be able to uncover a Mississippi Black history mystery? Ever tell this. That old goat, he's my second cousin. One woman from Mississippi on a search to find out if J. Edgar Hoover is her cousin. J. Edgar Hoover was a secretive man who went down in history as the father of modern day law enforcement. Did he pass for white? Throughout history, blacks found it beneficial to pass for white. In the movie Imitation of Life, there's a daughter of a black mother who is single. She is struggling to provide for them. The daughter, who is one of a lighter complexion, moves on with her life without her black mother as she passes for white. However, that's only a movie. But what do you do when you are a little 10-year-old girl from Mississippi who is struggling to find out if the most feared, powerful man in America is your cousin? Good evening. J. Edgar Hoover has died at the age of 77, the cause given as high blood pressure. For almost every living American generation, Hoover, the director of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, stood as the symbol of incorruptible law enforcement and untouchable who liked to boast that his men could not be bought. Hoover had dinner last night with his old friend and longtime FBI associate, 71-year-old Clyde Tolson, and then went to his home where his housekeeper found him this morning dead beside his bed. In 1924, during the Coolidge administration, Hoover took over the then scandal-ridden bureau. Thus began a service that spanned eight presidencies in almost half a century. The eight presidents under whom he worked, both Democratic and Republican, gave Hoover virtually a free hand to run an FBI he had cleared of political factionalism and made into an investigative organization envied around the world for its efficiency and high standards. Yet toward the later years of his life, Hoover came under increasing criticism from liberals who saw his operations as a big brother type threat to civil liberties. He was accused of using the FBI as his own public relations instrument and his preoccupation with the threat of communism seemed dated. Yet Hoover himself saw communism as a real threat to the security of America. Communists have been, still are, and always will be a menace to freedom, to democratic ideals, to the worship of God, and to America's way of life. I feel that once public opinion is thoroughly aroused as it is today, the fight against communism is well on its way. The Communist Party of the United States is a fifth column if there ever was one. Hoover visited the Capitol just a month and a half ago to testify at a congressional hearing. And it's there, his body will be returned tomorrow to lie in state in the rotunda until shortly before funeral services on Thursday. These rites will be conducted at the National Presbyterian Church at an hour not yet determined. President Nixon will deliver the eulogy, but he may have spoken his epitaph today when he said, the FBI is the eternal monument honoring this great American. And the president elaborated on that tribute. It is with a profound sense of personal loss that I learned of the death of J. Edgar Hoover. This truly remarkable man has served his country for 48 years under eight presidents as director of the FBI with unparalleled devotion and ability and dedication. For 25 years, from the time I came to Washington as a freshman congressman, he's been one of my closest personal friends and advisors. And every American, in my opinion, owes J. Edgar Hoover a great debt for building the FBI into the finest law enforcement organization in the entire world. I have ordered that all the flags in government buildings be flown at half-mast. But I will say that in doing so, that Edgar Hoover, because of his indomitable courage against sometimes very vicious attack, has made certain that the flag of the FBI will always fly high.
It was a short while before the public announcement and before flags were lowered to Haas staff when FBI teletypes carried the message to agents and FBI employees around the country that the man who had occupied the director's office for nearly 48 years was dead. The work and the public functions of the FBI went on. Announcement of a new arrest in connection with the Yablonsky murders, the regular tours of FBI facilities. Tours to bear the mark of Hoover's lifelong concern over subversion and what he considers its principal source. Those tours went almost as on any other day. Okay. I mentioned before that Mr. Hoover passed away this morning. He became director of May 10th, 1924. May 10th this year, he would have been director for 48 years. He passed away in his sleep of natural causes. At mid-afternoon, acting Attorney General Kleindienst read a brief tribute to Hoover. As might be expected by a person in his position, at the head of an investigative body, he was from time to time the object of misplaced public attack, all of which he bore with the firmness and dignity of greatness. Without political ambition, he shunned any other office and never permitted the FBI to become the least tainted with political influence from any source. More than once he expressed a desire to continue at his post until the end and his wish has been fulfilled. Another associate recalled Hoover's reaction to critics who said that he wanted to hang on to his job until the massive new FBI building rising on Pennsylvania Avenue is finished. Hoover had joked, the associate said, if they keep going at the rate they've been going, none of us will be around when it's done. Another of his favorite buildings was the Mayflower Hotel, the only place besides the racetrack where he was seen regularly in public came here most days for lunch, always eating in the same quiet, dark public room, always at the same table, always with his back to the wall. Maitre d' Lewis Bayer usually had the meal ready and waiting. It seldom changed. Chicken soup, lightly buttered toast, little else. Waiter Joe Chapman says Mr. Hoover smiled and joked a lot and knew all of the help on a first name basis. We kind of miss him or will miss him because uh, even the public uh, were expecting him every day when he walked through and uh, no sh uh, nothing special, just he was pleasant, nice and people miss him as a great friend. Well, he's also a jolly fellow and easy to wait on, easy going guy and he liked for me to tease him a lot and so we have a lot of fun together. So it turns out that while J. Edgar Hoover worked hard to have his image in public generally to be that of a tough cop. No one here at the Mayflower, where he often came, ever thought of him that way. Dan Rather, CBS News, the Mayflower Hotel, Washington. Hoover was a native of Washington, son of a coast and geodetic service employee and the niece of the first Swiss consul of the United States. He never married. The White House announced this evening that President Nixon will name at least a temporary successor to Hoover tomorrow. Who was J. Edgar Hoover's real father? Ivy Hoover was mysteriously murdered in 1917. At that particular time, J. Edgar Hoover was just beginning his career in the FBI and had just been promoted in the FBI. And the census records reveal that after Ivy's death, Annie ended up back in Washington, D.C. with her husband, Dickerson. The reason why Annie came back was because Ivy mysteriously was killed. And that was part of the secret in the family, that Ivy, there was two murders in our family that made us say that you could never tell that J. Edgar Hoover is related to us. He is passing, this is what was said, he is passing for white. So when she left and went back to Washington, why would she stay? Her lover was killed. There was no certificate of birth filed for J. Edgar. Additionally, the entry for John Edgar in the DC index of births is smudged and written in different pen and style, clearly added at a much later date with the certificate number out of order and containing the suffix D, indicating a delayed filing. Oh, there's no doubt in my mind that, that the records surrounding J. Edgar Hoover seem very suspicious. There's no doubt about it. There were a lot of records that were actually smudged, different handwritings, 
different formats on the documents. They had to white out and then try to rewrote over it. And when Hoover finally filed his birth certificate, he also submitted a letter from his church certifying his baptismal record. The letter gives his birth date as June 1, 1895 with a J-A-N for January written over the June in noticeably different handwriting. And the baptismal record itself lists Hoover's birth date as the 1st of June, not January. Even more curious is the fact that Hoover wasn't baptized until he was 13 years old, when the various churches his family frequented all practiced infant baptism. And though Millie wasn't the first to notice these document discrepancies, she was certainly the first daring enough to discuss them openly. I had suspicions when I was a brand new agent that he might possibly have some black blood because one of my jobs in investigating uh, applicant cases, we always check birth records and educational records, death certificates, just, you were always in the clerk's office, county clerk's office, reviewing records. And there were a couple friends who did this routinely in, in Washington, D.C. They checked applicants. And I talked to one of them one time, and he said, you know, just for the fun of it, uh, I tried to find Hoover's birth record, and there's something wrong with it. <laughs> and I said, oh? I said, yeah, I thought you'd be able to go all the way back to Europe with his record. No. And he was telling me about it. And he found some rather strange Things like the, there were some things that were erased, dates were changed, and, and uh, the filings. And I thought, hmm, that's weird. Weird as it was, it didn't really surprise the few FBI agents who found out about it, for it only confirmed what they'd long suspected. There were rumors uh, among agents who were friendly that Hoover might have some black blood because of his short cropped hair. Some agents just flat out said, I think he's part black. And that takes a lot of courage because you never know who's listening. You know, some submarine in the office would send a letter off to Hoover. Agents also thinks you're part black. You're gone. And Millie's research revealed even more evidence that Hoover had been living a lie, not only in claiming to be Caucasian, but also in hiding the fact that he was illegitimate, an outside child, as the oral story stated. And incredibly, documentation of this was found on the application filled out in 1938. On the application it says, if you are legitimate or not, it says check yes or no, are you legitimate? And, he ch and whoever checked it checked no. Oral history is crucial in black genealogy because with illiteracy and slave trading, slaves had no other way to keep track of their relatives who were often sold and whose names were sometimes changed at the will of the new slave owners. My thing was, since white America says that our oral stories, our grandparents sit up and lie to us or it's just rumors, I wanted to prove it. I set out on a mission to prove that oral history is just as strong, or even probably better, than documented history. Like many descendants of slaves, Millie's oral family tradition traced all the way back to Africa, and the story was oft repeated as it was passed around campfires, hearths, porches, and family gatherings from generation to generation, that there were three very tenacious women in the Allen ancestry leading the lineage through and out of slavery. The first was a young woman known to the family only as Grandmama Elizabeth's mother, who was taken at 16 years of age from Africa to America, where she was impregnated by her slave master, a powerful politician and preacher named Christian Hoover. When her baby was born, it was said the beautiful half-white baby slave girl was named Elizabeth Allen. Elizabeth Allen was also impregnated at a young age by her father, the slave owner, and she gave birth to a beautiful mixed-race baby girl named Emily Allen. This complicated things considerably, since it made Emily both daughter and granddaughter of the slave owner, Christian Hoover. This is very bizarre, and it's, and it's hard to explain because it's like a, a web. Now, let me explain it to you. Christian Hoover, who was born in 1796, who was a senator, 
a state legislator and a minister in Macomb, very well-known man, was married to a white woman by the name of Mary. He had a son, he had two sons, we're gonna talk about the two sons that connected to my family. He had a son by the name of William Hoover who was born in 1832, and he had a son by the name of Christian who he named after himself, but his nickname was Kit, Christian Kit, who was born in 1840, and he had Emily, who is my great-great-grandmother, who was born in 1840 by his slave uh, that he owned, Elizabeth, who was born in 1814. Christian and William came from the white wife. Emily came from the slave girl. According to the oral history, Millie's great-great-grandmother Emily was left behind with her slave master father slash grandfather and her white half-brothers and sisters when her mother Elizabeth met and fell in love with another family member named William Hoover, who also impregnated her with the baby they named John Hoover. After giving birth to Emily's half-brother John, Elizabeth left with the baby and his father heading for the Maryland, Washington, D.C. area where they married and she passed for white her entire life. Meanwhile, back in Mississippi, Elizabeth's daughter Emily was having lots of babies with her white half-brothers, Christian Kit and William, starting when she was only 19 years old. Emily had eight children in all, and the first one was fathered by her half-brother, Christian Kit Hoover. Christian Kit, uh, the white son of Christian Hoover, got in bed with his half-sister, Emily, and from that, they had a son, and that son is Ivory Hoover. Next, Emily had a baby girl fathered by another white plantation owner named F. Macomb. After that, she birthed six more babies, all with the same father, William, who happened to be one of her other white half-brothers, the one she would later be willed to. Christian Hoover, the slave owner, willed Emily, his daughter, to his son, William Hoover, born 1832, and he was married. He had a white wife named Martha, and then he proceeded to have babies with Martha, his wife, and, and the slave, which was his sister, and they had six children together. Back in the days of slavery and before birth control, it was not uncommon for women, both black and white, to birth a baby every year or two. It wasn't talked about openly, but it was likewise not unusual for slave owners to have babies every year or so, not just with their wives, but also with select slave women they called bed warmers. It, that's, that's a secret that they were having sex with relatives. And under the one drop racist rule, the mixed race children that resulted were legally considered black, no matter how white they appeared. And life for them was not necessarily easy. On one hand, they say white people don't want them. And on the other hand, darker black skin folk are jealous of them. And that goes back to the, in the big house, you know, the lighter skinned ones got in the big house, so they had better food sometimes. They had the darker skinned ones were working out in the field all the time. And those who opted to pass for white, or had it forced upon them, as we shall see in J. Edgar Hoover's case, had it even rougher. I think it's deadly. I think it's a deadly uh, situation, because if you were passing, you had to make sure they didn't know, and sometimes you had to make sure they didn't know. Young people actually cut themselves off totally from their family. 